In this video, we're going to look at two-dimensional conduction. We're going to use a finite volume numerical method in order to solve some two-dimensional conduction problems for which we cannot find analytic solutions. All the while, we're going to think about the physics of the conduction processes going on in these geometries. So we'll start with a brief introduction to the finite volume solutions of the heat conduction equation. We'll test the resulting code and we'll apply it to situations you can't solve analytically. Overlaid here, I have a numerical grid on top of a finite volume solution for heat conduction in a problem where we have constant temperature boundaries around these three sides and a different temperature here. In order to explain this method, of course, we're solving the conservation of energy equation. It could, in general, mean that for any individual volume within our discretization, we have energy coming into that volume. Here's two examples of energy being conducted in. Energy going out. Here's two examples of energy being conducted out. We could have thermal energy generation inside that volume. And if the problem was unsteady, we could have uh, energy being stored or rejected from the volume with time. And so we need to apply each of these terms in order to calculate the algebraic equations that we'll solve. Now, each control volume that we've drawn in here affords us the ability to write one statement of conservation of equations. So we can write one statement for each and every one of these. And of course, we have exactly that number of unknown temperatures. So we'll end up with a system of exactly the right number of algebraic equations to solve for all the unknown temperatures. The general control volume for all of the interior volumes is shown here. We can easily approximate these conduction terms based on the adjacent temperatures and linear approximations of the gradients using Fourier's law. We can easily add energy generation through the entire volume, and we can easily add the energy storage. We'll have to pay careful attention to the boundary conditions. For example, looking at this boundary here, here we'll have to apply a boundary condition and we'll have to write a different conservation of energy equation to implement in our matrix to ultimately solve the algebraic equations. So in this example, we have a corner volume, and the corner volume has a dimension here, which is delta y over 2. In this example, the interior control volumes are all the same, and they're a full delta x and delta y, delta x and delta y. But in the corner volume, it's of course a delta x over 2 in this direction, and a delta y over 2 in this direction. So we'll need to apply boundary conditions. We, could, we have different choices. QE is going to be a boundary condition. In order to get the flux going out at the east face here, perhaps we specify a constant heat flux. And then when we want to evaluate QE, that will simply be that specified heat flux in watts per meter squared times the area delta y over 2 times 1 into the screen to make it an area. Or perhaps on the north face, we want to apply a convection boundary for Q north. Perhaps we want to specify a convection coefficient, multiply it by its area, which of course is delta x over 2, not delta y over 2, at times the temperature of the volume we're solving for minus t infinity. And we'll be careful how we write this. I've drawn the arrow in q north pointing outwards, and therefore I want to make sure that my description of Newton's law of cooling matches this. If the heat is going to be out, ti has to be a higher number than t infinity n, and this is the correct way to to write it. It's no problem if, the, if in reality heat is coming in because I will solve for a temperature which is lower and I'll actually get a negative. What's important when I formulate it is that the equation that I use matches whether I've called it an in or out, which is what I'm putting into my conservation of energy equation. And of course the conduction fluxes are easy to estimate. Q at the west phase will be from Fourier's law minus the conductivity times the area, which is a delta y over 2, times 1 into the screen, times the temperature difference between tij and ti minus 1 comma j, divided by the distance between these two, which is still a full delta x. Similarly, on the south face, we have from Fourier's law minus the conductivity times the area, which is a delta x over 2, times 1 into the screen for our two-dimensional problem, times tij minus tij minus 1, divided by the distance between them, which of course is a delta y. We can look at another boundary volume. For example, let's look at this volume here. Now when we're looking at this one, we have a full extent in the delta y direction, but it's only half a volume in the delta x. So our, our area for, for the north and south faces is delta x over 2, but our area 
for the east and west faces is a full delta y. So we would apply our conservation of energy over this volume and our conduction fluxes, just like before on the west face, is identical to as it was before, except that our area is now a full delta y, not a delta y over 2. And we have tij minus ti minus 1j over delta x, the full distance between these two points. Similarly, on the for the south, it's the con minus the connectivity times the area, which is a delta x over 2, times tij minus tij minus 1 over that spacing delta y. On the north face, we can do the same thing again. The area is a minus delta x over 2, and it's tij plus 1 minus tij divided by the spacing between those, a delta y. Now we'll have to add the boundary conditions, and on this east face, perhaps I have a constant specified flux, in which case I would simply use Q east being the specified heat flux times the area delta y times 1 into the screen. Or, alternatively, I could apply convection with Newton's law of cooling, and I could say that that heat flux was instead a specified convection coefficient on the east face times the area delta y times 1 into the screen times, times the area delta y times 1 into the screen times the temperature difference tij minus the t infinity far away and of course we write it this way because I've drawn this as a heat flux going out as a heat rate going out and for that to be a heat rate going out tij has to be higher than t infinity east. And so we could repeat this same applying any boundary conditions we wanted to over all of these boundary volumes and if you have a particular problem you want to solve you may want to be uh, you, will, you will be formulating conservation of energy for each of those boundary volumes. Usually, of course, you'll find that perhaps this whole side is the same, and so the equation you derive for all of these will be identical, and it won't be that much work. You always have your four corners uh, that may be unique, and of course, it's not so hard to generalize this into a general computer code, which is what I've done, so that we can apply different boundary conditions to any section of any of these boundaries. And also, we can apply uh, heat generation within the volumes. So far everything in this video everything in this video assumes a steady state however. Let's start by testing the code. I've written the computer code, I've written it in Python, and I want to test it and make sure it works before I do something serious with it. So let's take a simple one-dimensional case where I've specified a temperature of 100 on this top surface and a temperature of 100 on this top surface and a temperature of 50 on this bottom surface. I've insulated both of the sides, so even though I'm solving a two-dimensional problem, it's actually a one-dimensional solution, and that's good because I know everything I need to know about it. I can solve this problem in my head. Of course, I see I do get a one-dimensional solution. The temperature decreases linearly as I move down in the y direction. I can see that it's linear because each of these contour lines is perfectly equally spaced, which means the temperature drop between each of these same distances is exactly the same. It's clearly a linear temperature profile. Now I put a conductivity of 400 watts per meter Kelvin and a temperature difference of 50. That means with the dimension being 1, the temperature gradient, the average temperature or the temperature gradient is 50 degrees over 1 meter or 50 degrees per meter. The area is 1 because my dimension is 1 and so my heat rate is going to be my conductivity times that 50 degree temperature difference and of course, that's exactly what I see. What I'm seeing here is on my insulated boundaries at the west, the heat rate is zero. My insulated boundary at the east, the heat rate is zero. At the south boundary, I have what should be a heat in of a minus 2000, which means it's actually a heat out. So it's in the negative direction, it's a negative value. We'll have 2000, 20,000 watts are coming out, which is exactly 400 times 50. It's 20,000 watts and it's perfectly balanced by a heat rate at the north face of also minus 20,000 watts coming in at the north face. It's coming in here, it's going out here, and of course my, my imbalance is 10 to the minus 8 compared to my 20,000 watts, so this is a very good solution, and I have no generation in this problem. Now, I can always calculate the heat flux vectors. And in this case, because it ends up being a one-dimensional problem with a constant heat rate, 20,000 watts is coming in here, 20,000 watts is passing through every cross-section and out here, of course my heat flux vectors are constant values of 20,000 uh, watts, or 20,000 watts per meter squared, and they're all in the, in the downwards direction. 
Now, it's a good idea to test my computer code and make sure that I haven't made errors in, in developing it. And one way to start doing that is to switch which of these boundaries has the two different temperatures. So I'm going to put the same temperatures on the west and east faces and the insulation on the top and make sure I get the same thing. And when I do that, I get exactly the same heat balance, exactly the same and ex exactly the same heat rate and expected heat rate passing through it in this direction. Now it's coming in at the west value, 20,000 watts in the positive direction. It's going out at the east boundary, 20,000 watts in the positive direction. Uh, and the solution is identical except for the fact that it's rotated because I switched the boundaries. All of the temperature contours are perpendicular to the side boundaries, which are insulated. And so the heat rate at those side boundaries is zero as it should be. And now I can try it with instead of two temperature boundaries, I can specify a heat flux at the top at the top boundary and a temperature at the bottom boundary. When I do this, the code will calculate what the temperature is at this phase. I have a thousand watts going out at the north face. That's how I've specified it: a positive a thousand watts per meter squared and a one meter uh, one meter dimension here, one meter into the screen. And so I have, as expected, a thousand watts moving out. And of course, I have a thousand watts coming in at the south boundary. I can check that my temperature is right because I know that in this one, in this truly one-dimensional problem, the heat flux is K temperature difference over the distance between them, and so I can solve for what T2 would be with this given heat flux. I can see right away that with K a thousand and L being one, with the heat flux being a thousand watts per meter squared and the dimension being one, my conductivity is 400, so a thousand divided by 400 is 2.5, so I should have 2.5 degrees less than I have at my specified temperature of 50, and that's exactly what I see. My minimum temperature here is 47.5 degrees. Now let's try applying it to problems that we can't solve analytically or do in our head. So here's a case where I'm going to specify the temperature is 50 at the bottom surface. It's insulated along both of these sides, and it's insulated up to these lines and on these lines alone, I specify, a, on these areas in here, I specify a convection coefficient and a hotter temperature, T infinity north. Now, I can see from this solution that the hottest temperature is up here. And energy is coming in through this boundary. These boundaries are all insulated. All of the temperature contours are perpendicular to these boundaries. Perpendicular to the insulation, perpendicular to the insulation. And far enough away, this thermal energy is spread out enough that we're achieving our one-dimensional solution far away. And if we extended this downwards, we would see it's very much the one-dimensional solution. But what we have is the thermal energy spreading out to use up all this area as it moves down, and we can clearly see the insulated boundaries. Again, our energy balance matches perfectly. We have 9,249 9, watts going out the south boundary in the negative direction, and that exact amount is coming in at the north boundary. I can again calculate my heat flux vectors and see that they are everywhere perpendicular to the temperature contours, as I would expect. That's what Fourier's law tells us, that the heat flux is conductivity times the temperature gradient. So it's always moving against the temperature gradient. And that enables me to clearly draw these lines. If I take lines that are parallel to these heat flux vectors, I can clearly see where the heat is moving, where the thermal energy is moving. And these lines are called adiabats. We'll make use of them in another video. Now I can start to add generation. It looks like this solution is where they came up with the introduction to the Looney Tunes cartoons. But what I've done here is I've specified a constant temperature of 100 degrees around all four of these boundaries. And I put a very small thermal generation over a very small area right in the center of 1,000 watts per cubic meter. My conductivity is again 400 watts per meter Kelvin. And so what happens in this situation is thermal energy is generated within the part here, and it has to leave to all these boundaries. Now because this problem is symmetric, we find that this is perfectly centered and everything is symmetric. We find that heat is leaving at every boundary. So I'm expecting, or the way I've defined the problem, it's heat in at the west boundary. I'm seeing a negative value. So heat is going out at the west value, west boundary. It's going out at the east boundary, a positive value. It's going out at the south value, south boundary, a negative value. And it's going out at the north boundary, a positive value. And each of these numbers are equal. If I calculate the volume of this little area and multiply it by the Q dot that I've specified, 
I'm expecting 130.6 watts to be generated, and that's exactly what's being generated, and conservation of energy is being observed globally. I can, of course, calculate my heat flux vectors again and see exactly what's happening. Heat is flowing out of this surface towards the boundaries, as expected, always perpendicular to the temperature contours. We can get more interesting with this and apply that generation over a larger area, but an area that's no longer symmetric. And then we get what looks a little bit like a cat's eye on its side. Uh, but of course, now the problem is no longer symmetrical and we see there's a difference. While heat is still exiting at all four of the boundaries, there's a difference between the east and west boundaries and the north and south boundaries. And so we still do, do see a certain symmetry. The, the problem is symmetric about this axis. And so, of course, we see that the east and the west are the same and the north and the south are the same. The expected rate of thermal energy generation is observed inside the volume and we have conserved energy. Now notice here my imbalance is climbing a little bit. This is 2.7 watts compared to 200 odd watts going through those faces. So we're getting down to about a 1% error in our global energy conservation. Of course I could make that better by adding more and more volumes in my solution. I've just done this for an, uh, for an example to make this video but if I really wanted to know these numbers with precision, I would use a larger number of volumes or a smaller control volumes in order to get this get a better solution. And again, we can calculate the heat flux vectors everywhere perpendicular to the temperature contours and look at the way the thermal energy is moving within this part. Now, these heat flux vectors that I've calculated, I can plot or I can multiply them by the little bit of area at each place here and calculate the heat rate at each of these surfaces. So now what I've done is I've superimposed on this plot the heat rate that's going out of each of these faces over the whole face. And of course the total is simply adding all of these up or integrating these curves to get the numbers that are in this table. But we can see how that heat is leaving that part and we can infer it from looking at the diagram as well without having to do the calculation. We can clearly see the temperature contours are very far spaced apart here and so there's very low heat fluxes. They're much closer together here and so there's a higher heat flux, and the same over here. They're even closer together here, so there's an even larger heat flux here. So what we see in this geometry is that there's virtually no heat flux in the corners. There is no heat flux in the corners, and all of the heat thermal energy is leaving uh, in between the corners where the paths of least resistance are found. Of course, it would have to take a farther path to get out to this corner than to go straight across here. Now we can take this even further and put multiple regions of generation. So here I've kept the outside boundaries together again at 100 degrees, and I put four different regions, some of different sizes, where I have my constant heat generation. Of course, I've calculated what I expected it to be and see that it is what I'm getting. And similarly, we have energy conservation to within 1.5 watts, and we're talking about hundreds of watts. So it's, again, within a percent or so. I could use a finer volume and get this even better. But this might represent, for example, a circuit board where we have a number of chips on, the, on that circuit board which are generating heat. And we could use this technique in order to observe how the heat is flowing in there and effectively plan our cooling strategy to make sure that nothing was overheating on that circuit board. Again, of course, we can calculate the heat flux vectors and see that they are everywhere perpendicular to the temperature contours and everything as we expect it to be and everything is as we expect it to be. In this video, we've looked at a number of numerical solutions to two-dimensional conduction problems, and we've observed that the heat flux vectors are always perpendicular to temperature contours, and of course, as we know from Fourier's law, any time we have an insulated boundary or an axis of symmetry, the heat flux will be zero there, and the temperature contours will always be perpendicular to that boundary. We've looked at applying energy balances globally over entire parts, and hopefully develop some intuition and understanding about two-dimensional conduction heat transfer.